Guy Austin, who is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning. Uh, Guy's uh, research is somewhere in between design and fabrication, so this presentation I think will be excellent uh, uh, end to this session. Guy has a, a first degree in computer science from the Hebrew University. He has another first degree in architecture. He has a master's degree from the Emergent Technology uh, Research Lab in the Architecture Association, and he's now uh, doing his PhD here. Besides that, Guy has a, a hands-on experience, both in uh, startup companies that deal with uh, robotics and fabrication, and in architecture firms. I'm honored to have Guy Austin with us. And Uh, thank you, Yasa. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me here. Um, yeah, while this is not my original session, it's really nice because somehow Filippo's amazing lecture and also uh, Isa's lecture kind of lead up to, to what I want to say. And I want to thank you for your amazing lectures. So I'm going to talk about rationalization. Actually answer the, last, the first question that came to Filippo is how do you make sure that the stuff you design can be built? Um, so we used to be builders. Architects weren't, uh, didn't exist 2,000 years ago. We were just the master stonemasons. The, the whole concept of an architect is something that's five or 600 years old. And um, so it's some guy who sits somewhere and draws something and gives it to the builder to build. So obviously, this creates a rift. There is some miscommunication. The whole point of BIM is kind of to heal this. So I'm approaching this from a different aspect. Because um, what happens a lot of the time, especially in complex projects like the one Filippo described, you design a shape, you have your fancy, you want something that looks like this is a Zahadi design, actually. And uh, if this would be in Israel, so the contractor would say, no, I can build it, but like that. Just straight lines, you don't mind, right? Uh, and since he's the guy with the money and the workers, he's the one who's going to get it built. So that's not really good for our profession. So we, we would, yeah, a classic example is, is what happened, with this is already a long time ago, 50 years ago. But I know if you know the story of Jorn Utzon, who was a fifth year architecture student when he won this competition with, with his amazing design. But he, desi oh, he designed one thing. And for 10 years, nobody could understand how to build it. And they had to go through this entire process of simplifying the geometry from complex to spherical, rational geometry in order for the uh, construction manager, for the site people to actually get it built. So this is called rationalization. Yeah, and here you can see the spheres kind of uh, segmented and uh, this is also actually the first use of one of the first uses of computation in architecture because these things were actually printed on paper laid out on the aluminum traced and then cut um, yeah and today as we've seen uh, in Filippo's lecture so the theoretically we can design whatever we want although there are also limits with that but when it comes to building it there are always problems uh, uh, Bilbao, Guggen, Gary's Bilbao is not known for leaking, you know, so there is this kind of, um, there's, there's still a gap between what we can design and what we can build, although we use super high-tech uh, equipment, CNC mills are already a thing of the past, now we can use robots and oh, soon there'll be helicopters building stuff, and theoretically we can use them to build whatever we want, but that's still not exactly the case, because these machines also have limitations. They have things they like to do and things they don't like. And I think knowing what they like and don't like is one of the most important things an architect can know today. Yeah, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Connect with the designer and the fabricator, so when the design passes to, to the fabricator, we can already be sure that it's buildable. Yeah, there are two traditional ways to do that. Either you design with shapes you know you can build, like uh, everything we saw in Israel's lecture, or spherical geometry, or we can post-rationalize. We can take a freeform design and rationalize it into something that the uh, constructor can 
uh, build. This is usually a computational process involving a lot of algorithms, and I'm sure <laughs> uh, I will uh, learn about it more in the f uh, after the lecture. Um, but, uh, but what I did before I started my PhD was kind of, I read a lot, and I tried to see how this process is actually performed in the practice today, according to hundreds of papers that I read. And what I saw is that there are actually f a bit more variation than that. I won't speak on all the taxonomy that I suggest in the paper that was just accepted to automation construction. I will speak about parametric design. Uh, parametric design, as uh, I was already kind of shown, is the, it's, first, it's a very common strategy in the building industry. The academia actually prefers pre-rational techniques. Um, and in a way, it's, it's the younger and more fun sister of BIM. Because it's at the stage where the parametric design is usually in the middle of the process, maybe towards the beginning. It's a stage where you have full geometric freedom, and you can describe complex geometry without uh, needing to detail every single nut and bolt. Um, so I want to make parametric rationalization methods that are targeted at machining constraints for digital fabrication. <sighs> and uh, I'm going to be talking about concrete, because this is Israel, we love our concrete. Um, we actually don't have any other building material. Uh, and it's also a very good uh, uh, material for complex geometry. You can cast it into any shape you want. It's a liquid, basically. The only problem is that you would need a mold, especially if you're using complex geometry. Today, these molds can be made in uh, one of these uh, ways, basically that's how they're made in the industry. There are new ways being developed, like uh, um, elastic molds, but they're not really incorporated into the industry yet. So either you can take flat panels and bend them, or you can mill EPS, which is styrofoam, calca, uh, either using a mill or using a robot. Now we're suggesting also to use uh, hot wires, which is like just big metal strings that can cut um, developable geometries from EPS, Calca. Um, why am I suggesting? I'm suggesting this kind of computational process get, that can translate between the designer and the builder using, uh, let, let's kind of see how this works. Uh, I'm using Grasshopper and Python, which is the same tools, uh, Rhino environment, which is what we saw Zaha uses in the early stages of the design process, a bit later on, just before they moved to Revit. And this is basically what I'm suggesting. Um, let's say I want a given geometry. So I give my uh, algorithm its geometry, the materials it wants to use, the tools it's a, it has available. It analyzes it both using NURBS and mesh analysis. It actually designs the mold. Like, so you need to have everything that's around the mold in order to make a geometry. And then it does a lot of mathematical calculations. Now that's the m biggest part of my PhD is finding how you can predict the behavior of this machinery using mathematics instead of simulating a CNC mill that goes like this and takes half an hour to simulate. Uh, and the results are always feasibility, like how much of this shape can be made, how much material do we need, and how much machine time will be necessary. So boom, yeah, we got it. That's one, two years of research into one slide. You have an input geometry. And then you have the four fabrication methods on your left, right. And in the middle, you have both the graphical uh, analysis of what's possible, what's not. The red is always impossible. And some numbers which can describe this geometry, both in terms of feasibility, material use, and machine time. So I started to validate this. I can tell you that it's relatively precise. I'm getting around 1% error, and it's very quick, something that typical CAM software would take half an hour, I can do in one or two seconds. Um, let's see how this works. Say, uh, a couple of months ago, Yasha came to me. He's my PhD instructor, by the way. Said, Guy, I need you to make a mold for this geometry. I said, fine, let's put it into my analysis. Let's see what happens. Um, and immediately you see the red. It's graphic. You can see it. And this is place we, we, we wanted to use a three-axis CNC to fabricate. So you can see where the three-axis CNC just cannot penetrate using the tools we have in our lab. 
And also you can see the number, so the, the, the it's not one. Uh, so I said, okay, let's have a chamfer the edges. I manually chamfer the edges, put again into the algorithm, and you can see I just created more problems, because now I have even more corners. Uh, I says, okay, bad idea, let's fill at the edges. Now this worked a bit better, the red is disappearing slowly, and then there's only these bits at the end where the, uh, we have to change drill bits, so we fill at those as well, everything is not red, and we can go to fabrication, which we did. We put it into our mill. They were actually pretty fast to mill because they were rationalized. And uh, yeah, it was. And then the whole fun began of uh, assembling the mold, casting it, vibrating it, uh, letting it dry, extracting, and we have the finished tile, which if you look closely, you can really see the mill tracing on it. You can also see the holes, but that's not my fault. <laughs> uh, that's somebody else. Um, uh, the aggregates were a, bit, were a bit too big. All right, so it kind of works and everybody's happy. And then, okay, so what if I want to improve this process a bit more and instead of me changing the geometry according to uh, the algorithm, I'll have the computer change it for me and fix it. So it's called optimization, this process. And the idea is to use my setup as it is um, use the feasibility, one of these, as an optimization criteria. Let's say I want to optimize for five axis milling. So I'm giving this as like the optimization goal. And uh, the genes, the, the things that can change the optimization are the control points of the sur that create the surface. And the border points can be constrained either only in Z or in X and Y, depending on what you want from the geometry. Um, so what you basically can see here is grasshopper optimizing uh, the geometry by itself, kind of, using a... But the, the nice thing is it, it uses a generic solver, a black box solver. Uh, this is a possum, but there are a lot of like genetic algorithms maybe you've heard about. Um, there are all sorts of solvers today that if you give them a target number, they'll work out the answer for you. So this is a very, they're brand new. So uh, in a way, my code was designed to use with these solvers. I don't need to invent a solver. Right? So uh, as you can see, uh, sorry, run a few times, but it, the red disappears and it becomes all uh, nice and yellow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I could, basically I could take the same shape and optimize it for four different fabrication methods. Depends on what I have in my lab. And, and you can see that I wasn't completely successful. The shape was too complex to be made from bent sheet material. So it was only like 70% successful, but for the rest of the, of the methods, I could create a 100% feasibility. And this process takes 10, maybe 30 minutes. It's not, it doesn't take that long. It really is relatively easy to set up. Yeah, um, so before I say thank you, the, this is kind of, I have a year, a year and a half left in my PhD. Um, I want to incorporate uh, work from done now in the computer science department next door. Um, they have a very fancy geometric modeler called IRIT. It's a neural modeling system that's much more powerful than Rhino. And I want to incorporate it into my uh, setup so I can use uh, its functionality. Uh, I want to implement other fabrication methods. I need to validate this. It's a PhD. It's not properly proven to be uh, functional. Uh, optimization, I can develop a bit more. And I also want to try to use my algorithms for facade subdivision. So you take an entire facade and say, <coughs> if I have a three axis CNC, I would divide it this way. If I'm using a hot wire, I would divide it that way. Um, so that's it. I showed you how I want to connect architects, machines, and all the people around them using the computer. Thank you.